Good afternoon. Good evening, almost. Welcome to IPI. My name is Adam Smith. I'm the manager of IPI's Peace Operations Program. And this is the New York launch for Ziff's Peace Operations 2025. Right now, I'm joined by two out of the three expected panelists. Um, Mr. Ladzus is running a little bit late, but he'll be here very soon. Uh, I'm joined first to my left by Dr. Amit Veland Karimi, who is the director of the Center for International Peace Operations. And to my far right, I'm joined by Ambassador Miguel Berger, who is the deputy permanent representative of Germany to the United Nations. And as I said, we will be joined shortly by the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Mr. Hervé Ladzus. Very happy to be partnering once again with the Center for International Peace Operations located in Berlin, ZIF. Uh, we began our, our partnership very recently, three months ago, when uh, ZIF and ourselves and the Pearson Center partnered on a regional roundtable as part of the Being a Peacekeeper series. And in a bit of shameless self-promotion, we have the meeting reports available outside for that meeting. Uh, the topic was enhancing European military and police contributions to UN peacekeeping. So we're very, very excited to have Ziff here today and to launch this uh, very, very interesting publication. By way of disclaimer, IPI uh, did not play a role in, in producing Peace Operations 2025, although we are a bit jealous of the cool design. Um, if you'll see it, please make sure to take a copy outside. Uh, but we're very happy to, to uh, co-host this discussion today with, uh, with Ziff and the, uh, the German mission. Um, with that, maybe I can uh, first hand the floor over to Ambassador Berger. You have his bio in front of you, so I, I will not uh, go through it. But Ambassador, if you could give us uh, five, 10 minutes uh, about the future of peace operations as you see it, some of the challenges, uh, set some context for us. That would be great. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And let me start by thanking IPI for organizing this uh, launch today. You have mentioned the conference in Berlin in, in October, the roundtable which was very interesting and successful. We also had a conference on UN police uh, in October in Germany. So, and together with the study, uh, you see we are very much in, engaged in, in, in all these issues. And uh, so thank you very much for, for inviting us. And uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, peacekeeping has since the first observer mission, UNSO, in 1948, developed into the flagship activity of the United Nations, being designed in the aftermath and under the fresh impression of the atrocities of World War II, the main purpose of the UN Charter was to address threats to world peace and security caused by armed conflicts between sovereign states, meaning to keep the peace. However, since then, peacekeeping has undergone, as we know, a number of very substantial changes. This applies to both the threats being posed to international peace and security and the way these threats are being addressed through the UN. Challenges to peace and security have become far more diverse and multidimensional than most actors within the UN system or other relevant institutions would have thought not long ago. And let me mention one meeting that took place on Friday a RIA formula meeting organized by Pakistan and the United Kingdom on climate change and, and conflict, uh, where a study was presented by the World Bank how a four degree Celsius uh, world would look like. And uh, this is a, uh, a scenario, our scenarios for the year, the end of this century, but it gives a good impression of the multi-dimensional challenges which uh, we will all have to face. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to speak at this launch, which attempts to think about the peacekeeping world in the future. Although one might argue that within the next 12 years, nothing fundamental is going to change. We have seen shifts of paradigms within far shorter periods of time. We are therefore grateful for Ziff's endeavor and the book it resulted in. First of all, I would like to commend CIF for managing a balancing act. 
On the one hand, Peace Operations 2025 is a state-of-the-art academic study. It's more scientific than political approach, which has the very refreshing effect, particularly here at the United Nations, that its way of thinking is different from what we are used to in the world of international politics and diplomacy. On the other hand, there is more to this book with its inspirational design, which you already mentioned, and the vivid presentation of the different scenarios. It aims at readers of all specifications, age, ages, and nationalities. It wipes off the dust of our usual diplomatic and political discussion and provides us with a new and stimulating view on the issue. As you will see, CIF has taken into account not only political factors, but, and that makes this study so interesting, it takes also into account key factors like economic development, environmental, sociological, and technology developments. It draws from an expertise that is as broad as it is deep. We are all familiar with the current challenges faced by the UN in order to adapt to some of the more recent developments in the peacekeeping world. This concerns issues like new means of coordination and cooperation with partners like regional and sub-regional uh, organizations, the use of modern technologies, as well as a review and reassessment of its own structures. Peace Operations 2025 presents a set of additional challenges, and the four possible future scenarios described therein are surely a valuable contribution to the discussion. You will judge yourself how likely these scenarios are. Some might become reality one day, whilst others will remain possibilities or even nightmares that hopefully never translate into reality. But one thing is clear, the peacekeeping system will face a number of new challenges in a rapidly changing world, and the UN will have to adapt to them in order to fulfill the mandates. So in order to live up to these challenges, peacekeeping has to create and maintain structural and operational flexibility to adapt to these challenges. This call for flexibility is not new, but flexibility has many foos. It is expensive, it requires the use of modern technologies, it demands constant training, it means adapting and the willingness to adapt to new situations. Colleagues, let me conclude with a brief remark with regard to the present and probably future shortcomings of the UN peacekeeping system. As friends of UN peacekeeping, we do not deny that it is far from being perfect. Nevertheless, we have to bear in mind that most countries that make the effort for international peace and contribute troop to peace operations are still in the face of their own development. While at the same time, the industrialized countries face serious economic constraints for their defense budgets. So we should all strive for a more inclusive and regionally balanced effort when it comes to troop contributions as well as financial and contributions of assets. The German Minister of Defense, Lothar de Maizière, said recently that the current system where the overwhelming troop contribution countries come from the developing world and the financial contribution is mainly shouldered by some Western countries is not sustainable. We all have an interest in keeping UN peacekeeping alive and active. The United Nations are the most legitimate voice of the international community. They are the best guarantor for peace and the fundamental principles laid down in its charter. And as long as we all adhere to these universal principles, we must continue to strengthen the UN and its peacekeeping capacities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Now I'd like to hand the floor over to Dr. Almut Vigeland Karimi, excuse me, uh, for to walk us through a little bit of the process and and what what is in the Peace Operations 2025. Please, thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming, and uh, we think 
there is hopefully some food for thought in this little booklet, the Scenario for Peace Operations 2025. And the question really is, how could the world of peace operations look like in 2025? What will be the main drivers, the main shaping factors, shaping the world of peace operations in 2025? To answer this question, we thought we should gather a group of experts, of practitioners, of uh, policy makers, decision makers, and some people who are not insiders to the world of peace operations. Together, we call this group the Futurologists of Peace Operations. Great, Mr. Latsus, you are here. So, warm welcome from my, from my side. And we met with this outstanding group in three interactive workshops in Berlin, in Addis Abeba, and here in New York. Some of the experts are here today, so if whatever complaints you have about the scenarios, you talk to our experts. If you like them, you talk to us. That's the division of labor for uh, today. <coughs> well, I have to underline that scenarios are not predictions or forecast, but they rather provide a tool for strategic planning. We have developed these scenarios in order to uh, imp to provide impulses for dialogue inside this peace operations uh, community. Uh, of course, they also could also be a basis for conceptual evolution in the field of peace operations. And um, what is important to us is that we ha have to understand today what we have to do in order that uh, our actions will lead to a more desirable outcomes and to avoid to the less desirable futures, so to say. So what we really want to promote is to ch a change in mode from a rather reactive mode we are right in to a proactive preventive mode. So we want to stimulate some out of the box uh, thinking and for that we developed these scenarios. Well, uh, as already said, there are four scenarios. The names speak more or less for themselves. We have the one which is politely called erratic progress. First, it was called muddling through. We thought it didn't sound too good, so we relabeled it to erratic progress. Then we have the national interest uh, scenario. Ambassador Berger called it more or less the nightmare scenario. And then we have regional diversity. And the fourth is kind of the dream scenario. It's called global cooperation. Today, I have to disappoint you, I will not introduce these four scenarios to you, but rather present the key factors, the key factors that, uh, that led to the development of the scenarios. So what we really did is for every key factor, we did the projection, how this key factor might develop in the future. And then we put the various projections together, and on these projections, we build the scenarios. That is the uh, technique. Uh, and of course, the key factors are important to understand. But if we had called this event today the key factor projections uh, workshop, none of you would have shown up. Uh, so we decided it would, would be much better to have a f uh, workshop on or an event on scenarios for peace operation, operations 2025. 20, uh, well, I want to make a little disclaimer uh, in the beginning. We don't mean to offend anybody with these uh, scenarios. And of course, uh, we, uh, there are events attributed to certain um, member states in these scenarios. But we have tried to be equally unfriendly or friendly on a geographic balance to all member states. But to stimulate a debate, you have to occasionally name names. That's what we do. We, we did, and we know that is, of course, not UN practice, but not being a UN institution, we decided um, that the text would otherwise be totally unconvincing. That's why we used them, but our apologies for anybody who might feel offended uh, by the text. As I said, the scenarios are built on key factors and on two given factors. Two given factors are the demographic growth and climate change. The directions of, of the future development of these two given factors, they are fairly clear and they're not really uh, a variety of projections. Much has been written and researched about them uh, in other places. Uh, just to give you a number, uh, the world population in 2025 will probably be about 8 billion uh, people. India overtakes uh, China as the biggest 
or most populated country uh, in the world. And of course, we have two mega trends, so to say. One is the youth bulge, and the other one is the global graying, as you uh, can see. Uh, the second one is the climate change. Uh, of course, it's also caused by population uh, growth. And uh, severe weather conditions can, of course, uh, lead to serious conflicts over land and water. And there is an estimate that in 2025, we will have several hundred million so-called climate refugees. So these were the two uh, given factors. I will quickly run you through the 12 uh, key factors. The first one is the state of the global economy. There are basically three projections. One is recession. Number two is a boom. And the third one, the probably most likely projection, is the differential, differential growth. Um, what it means that to, uh, already today that wealth inequality is a big driver for uh, conflict. And to give you a number again, 50% of the world population lives on 1% of global wealth. Well, the second key factor is uh, national interest versus global interdependence. Well, the interdependence in this world, as you all know, has grown, but nation states remain at the core of the international systems. So we had three basic projections. One is that we will have more multilateralism. One, the second one, that we would have a retreat from multilateralism. And the third, that we will have a new form like a mini-lateralism or something like club government. Third factor, the evolution of international and regional organizations. Well, the, the first projection, probably something Mr. Latsusi would like to hear, is that UN, UN retains the central role in, uh, in this world, and of course takes a modular approach uh, on drawing on more and more regional players. The second one is that the regional organizations are in charge for their regions. They don't go to the Security uh, Council to, uh, to ask for a mandate. And the third, which is probably the worst, is would be that there are only bilateral and ad hoc coalitions in the world of peace operations. Fourth key factor is the economic and policy power shifts. Well, we all know about the rise of the new powers, the so-called BRICS, but we also have the MICTS, as we say, which would be Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, and Turkey. And the question is how they will integrate in the future into the inter existing multilateral framework. Will the structures change or will be new structures created? The fifth uh, key factor is the evolution, uh, evolution of norms and values. As we all know, mentalities matter. And of course, people, peace operations are more legitimate in the eyes, especially of the people in the host country, um, when there is a consensus on global norms and values. But we've also seen in this field that there is a role for a new group of, we call them the norm entrepreneurs. Just to give you one figure, uh, the annual grant payment by the Open Society Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Ford Foundation equaled 50% of the peacekeeping budget in 2010. So this is a big number. Six <coughs> factors, state fragility. Well, of course, there is a clear connection between state fragility and violent conflict. I only have to refer to the uh, World Development Report in 2011. Just to state one figure, um, no fra fragile state has achieved any of the Millennium Development Goals. Seventh factor, organized crime. Um, of course, it can sustain uh, conflicts by providing resources for the so-called spoilers, or the ones who are not cooperating with peace operations. And already now, of course, it directly affects operations in the Balkans, West Africa, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. Factor, key factor number eight, resource scarcity. We all know that the demand for resources will grow. And of course, more conflict might evolve around or over the competition for resources. Then our factor number nine is what we kind of clustered together. It's migration, refugees, and diaspora. Uh, give you a figure now for today, we have uh, 220 million migrants 
migrants worldwide. And the number of migrants doubled in the years between 1960 and 2005. Until now, it's a south-south phenomenon. But uh, we know that migration will, uh, will, will grow. Plus, the diasporas will, do play a great uh, role. Uh, then we have factor number 10, new technologies. Well, of course, they are especially important at an operational uh, level. We just heard about it last uh, Friday. Of course, there are new options for, surve for surveillance and for monitoring. However, uh, new technology in the hands of non-state actors. They, of course, the potential to be bad spoilers and peace operations as well. And uh, cyber warfare might be the ultimate uh, asymmetric and terrible weapon uh, in, in peace operations being used against a peace operation. I have two more factors and then we are through them. One is new media. Uh, to give you a number, 30% of the world population has right now access to internet. And uh, we'll know that in, uh, by 2015, it's only two years to go, that in Sub-Sahara Africa and South Asia, more people will have mobile internet then they will have uh, internet access via using electricity. So they play a great role. And of course, the social media, as we have learned with the Arab Spring, but also in electoral observation, just to give the example of Kenya, do play a great role and probably an expanding role. Our last factor we developed are the role of private securities, uh, security companies. Well, the, the world's largest uh, private security company, uh, G4S, they are uh, listed at the London Stock Exchange as the biggest employer. They have 650,000 personnel. And of course, they do pose a challenge for peace operations. Um, it's a question of transparency, accountability, and of course, the rules of engagement have to be further development. Uh, they have to be further developed. So that was the quick run through, through, the piece of, uh, through uh, our scenarios. This is uh, a living document. So when you use it, don't put it on your shelf in your office, but you can use it. You can tear off these scenarios and the main key factors. You see, that's the way to do it. You can work with them. You can discuss them. That is really uh, the, main, the main idea. And well, our idea is that people use them for trainings, for dialogue, for discussions. Well. Let me close by thanking uh, Mr. Latous, Ambassador Berger, and Adam Smith, our colleagues from IPI, for not only being with us, spending time in a very busy week, uh, as we learned, and also you having a little bit problem with your throat. So we especially appreciate that. We wanted to, to bro boil some mint tea for you. But since we are not hosting, we forgot to ask our colleagues from IPI. And of course, uh, I'd also like to mention the two of my colleagues uh, who are here today, uh, Tobias von Gienan and Stefan Köppe. They are two of the main authors of uh, the scenarios. And look, looking uh, direction of Fabienne and Oliver and others, we of course had a great group of experts that helped us develop these uh, scenarios. <coughs> well, thanks to all of you and for all of you for coming and, and spending some time with us and listening to our scenarios. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Almut. Um, and let me reiterate a, a welcome and a thank you to, to Mr. Lazus for being here with us today. We know there are many, many things happening. Uh, the future is now, in a way, so it should be easy to talk about the future peace operations, in a way. Um, and we know that you've been under the weather, so, so thank you so much for being here uh, today. I have to say, just uh, on a personal note, I was quite impressed at the use of social media by, by UN Peacekeeping. I got a message from the UN Peacekeeping Facebook page telling me that this was being webcast before I got the IPI email that it was being. So I was quite impressed. So they're adapting very, very quickly. Um, on that note, maybe I'll hand it over to you. Everyone has uh, your bio in front of you, and I think you're well known to the community. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much. And let me apologize for having been late, but it was one of those slightly complicated days. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here for this uh, New York launch of this uh, very interesting uh, book, Peace Operations 2025, which I discovered uh, during that seminar that mm. uh, Germany, that ZIF hosted in October last year in Berlin. It was a very interesting and very useful event. So thanks to, to ZIF, thanks to International Peace Institute for hosting uh, 
this launch and indeed uh, trying to discern what the way is ahead uh, some 15 years from now. I think uh, to a large extent, based on past experience, one might say that what will happen will be to a large extent uh, the unexpected. I don't think that our predecessors at the time of the very first peacekeeping operations in the uh, very early 50s could have foreseen uh, what has developed uh, over the years since, and especially over the last uh, two decades, uh, which, come to think of it, is actually nothing short of uh, remarkable looking at all the handicaps, at all the challenges that were faced uh, over the years, and yet looking also at uh, the very real successes that were uh, met, uh, even though sometimes interspersed with some equally uh, rather spectacular failures. But overall, I think that uh, UN peacekeeping has been uh, a global uh, uh, success. Uh, and it was interesting that uh, only last month the Security Council, uh, for the first time in 11 years, was able to vote a resolution on peacekeeping which uh, enshrines all the uh, major acquis of the last uh, decade or so around the theme of uh, multi, uh, how do you say, multi-dimensional uh, peacekeeping. And I think I wish to take the opportunity to thank the Pakistan presidency of January for putting all this together and achieving what I think is a truly important uh, text. Now, uh, we don't know what the future will be, but uh, I will start from the premise that whatever happens, peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping will still be there. Because let's face it, not only has it had, has it had its successes, that cannot be denied, but also I think it represents a matter for large consensus within the international community. It is also good value for money. I think the comparison has been made of uh, the costs of uh, potentially a bilateral uh, peacekeeping or peace operation and what uh, UN peacekeeping operation costs. And I think the ratio ranges from anywhere between one or four to one to ten to one. Uh, so I think this is something to keep in mind. Now, uh, maybe to share with you a few thoughts about uh, what we are facing right now. First, in terms of, um, let me use a vulgar expression, but business volume. A year ago or so, um, I would have said, well, we are now entering a period of consolidation, and consolidation is a polite way to expressed the idea that indeed some missions had to go down in size. This is actually what is happening uh, in some cases. It's uh, happening in Darfur, it's happening in Liberia, it's happening in Haiti. It will happen probably, but we just sent a mission there in Côte d'Ivoire later this, this year, uh, of course, uh, security conditions permitting. Uh, we closed, of course, in December last year, the mission in Timor-Leste. So there was this apparent trend. And yet now, in the last uh, course of the last few months, we are facing a, a rather different situation, where at the same time, new business is coming, or likely to come uh, our way. And that's what we call the three S's. The first S, Sahel, actually stands mainly for Mali, where I would believe that, uh, of course, subject to the decision of the Security Council, before long, we shall be in a full uh, UN peacekeeping operation, taking over from uh, ECOWAS with various other actors, of course, in full partnership with the African Union, but definitely this is coming, as will be coming, uh, no doubt, uh, in the frame of uh, a year and a half to two years, Somalia, because as the level of peace enforcement by AMISOM, and I think they have to be applauded, commended for doing all they have been doing and achieving real success in containing and pushing back the Shababs as a military uh, operation. I think the curve for their peace enforcement activities will continue going down. And indeed, the need for 
peace building activities will be on a symmetric uh, ascending curve. And at some point within the next two years, probably the two curves shall meet. And then we will probably be looking at a uh, United Nations peacekeeping uh, mission. The third one is more hypothetical, but uh, it, we have been working on it uh, over the last uh, several months. Uh, it is, uh, of course, a hypothetical uh, scenario because it would suppose that there is a political breakthrough somehow or some new situation establishing itself on the ground, and that is Syria. Of course, uh, we don't know, I don't know, you probably don't know how it's going to shape up in the weeks or months uh, to come. Clearly, it is unacceptable. The figures of uh, people, in particular civilians, children killed or maimed, are absolutely horrendous. And I think uh, one has to wish very, very strongly that some process will emerge. And it is true that in some scenarios, some scenarios, not all, it may be necessary to consider some sort of a peacekeeping operation, including a robust scenario. And so we have to be uh, ready for this. We have to be ready knowing what we might do, and even more important, what we might not do. Because uh, in any case, it is not going to be a bed of roses. Far from there, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be dangerous, it's going to be uncertain, but we are doing uh, our work there. We have no other choice, of course. In fact, uh, I think all this shows a number of uh, new, um, new parameters in, uh, in peacekeeping, possible new parameters. One is that we are increasingly going into uh, environments which had nothing to do with the old-time peacekeeping, uh, environments in which there was simply a situation to monitor or to observe. So you had a bunch of military officers with binoculars standing pre pre preferably on, on a high place and just watching and reporting. Now we are increasingly in uh, high-risk situations, and I think the best illustration was given last year when we developed we deployed briefly the UN supervision mission in Syria, uh, ostensibly to monitor a ceasefire, but in fact, a ceasefire which never really existed. And let me say that it is actually a miracle that uh, we did not mm -hmm. uh, sustain uh, casualties. Uh, I simply note that uh, we had 12 armored vehicles which were completely destroyed in the process. So. I think it was also the courage of these people has to be uh, commended. And let's face it, uh, if there is to be a peacekeeping mission in, uh, the, in this uh, Mali, <coughs> it is not going either to be in a very uh, in a permissive uh, environment. Clearly, the French government has made it very clear that they want to carry the military tasks uh, underway against the extremists uh, slash jihadists uh, to uh, all the extent uh, achievable. And I think uh, that is very clearly stated. But what we've seen over the very recent days is that there is uh, increasingly, or potentially at least for the time being, the perspective of an asymmetric uh, environment where the uh, bad guys uh, will uh, put uh, mines here, IEDs there, uh, carry on surprise attacks. So this is something that we have to, of course, uh, take into consideration because safety and security of our personnel is uh, first and foremost amongst our concerns. But at the same time, if there is a job to do, if the Security Council asks us to do it, uh, that will have to be all taken into perspective. Sometimes the environment itself is also uh, something to which, uh, in which we take our share. As you know, we have been looking uh, in Eastern Congo at uh, the perspective of uh, putting together with African countries uh, intervention brigade, 
which will be in effect a sort of quick reaction force, but with a strengthened uh, mandate. And that, of course, uh, within a mandate which is already the one of MONUSCO, one of the most robust in the panoply of uh, existing UN mandates, that that one would go one degree further because explicitly the brigade would be tasked, subject to Security Council decision, with first uh, preventing the expansion of those armed groups that uh, sprout like toxic mushrooms after the rain, you know, all over the place. There's uh, at least 20 of them. Uh, so prevent their expansion. Second, neutralize their nuisance value, uh, neutralize them in effect. And third, uh, disarm those groups. <laughs> so that will be something of a very uh, robust nature. I think there is no choice. It is, of course, a military tool at the service of a political process, the political process that is hopefully going to be encapsulated on Sunday in Addis Ababa when the Secretary General and 11 heads of state of the region signed together the so-called framework agreement, which puts together commitments from the country, the first country first involved, the DRC, but also the countries of the region and a number of uh, regional and international actors as uh, witnesses. Uh, and that is what it's all about. So uh, this is uh, a first notion, I think, that we are operating increasingly in uh, areas where there is, uh, there are threats, there are risks, um, and that's a fact. Second, of course, is the issue that uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, the dosage um, to which uh, we work with um, regional and sub-regional actors. I think there is profound logic. It's the chapter eight of the charter, as you know, which had been envisaged, and what vision, by the way, in 1945 in uh, San Francisco, when there was practically no regional organization in the world, except maybe the OAS, mm -hmm. uh, to have foreseen that this notion could be one of the operational notions of the world in decades uh, yet to come. And it's true that there is profound logic in working in particular with the African Union, but also with the European Union, which I hasten to say is not a regional organization, something different, uh, but also to the extent possible with uh, uh, OAS, ASEAN, uh, even CSTO now. Uh, and I think there is logic and there is no temptation there, I think, from our side to shirk uh, our responsibilities. It is more a matter of um, incremental value added, you know, that these countries bring their knowledge, bring their, uh, their influence, uh, which can be sometimes not a good thing, but in most cases is a good thing, and try and make the processes work better in that way. Uh, regional organizations, but also sub-regional, and there, of course, we face a problem that these organizations are more often than not rather lightweight, uh, lacking in experience, lacking in personnel, lacking in means, and that there is a considerable effort to do to uh, work with them and to uh, try and help them, you know, to uh, uh, bring uh, value added again. But I think it's a process that uh, has to be kept in mind, as had to be kept in mind some situations like Somalia, where clearly what is called for is something that the UN can hardly provide. Uh, the uh, very, very strong uh, military action with the very strong potential for death and disabilities. And I think, uh, again, Amisom, uh, they've been incredible. Think of one country of Central Africa, of the Great Lakes area, which sustained 71 soldiers killed just in the course of one day. That was almost a year ago in Mogadishu. Now, let's be very frank. If that had happened in a UN peacekeeping mission, and we saw that, by the way, almost 20 years ago in that very same country, and that brought an end to the then UN mission in Somalia. So it's not a matter, do believe me, it's not a matter for cynicism. It's just a matter to uh, see that some 
perhaps sometimes can do things differently and more than we can, and that is uh, a fact of life, but one that has to be uh, borne in mind. Another element is that increasingly we find we face uh, what I call the transverse uh, threats. Uh, and certainly, uh, again, the situation in Mali is a proof of that, that uh, we face, uh, amongst other things, extremism, terrorism, but also international crime and drugs. Those uh, armed groups in the northern Mali, they thrive, they make their living at least, out of human trafficking. You would know that the price of hostages in that part of the world has shot up by a factor of 100 in the course of 10 years. And of course, they live uh, on drugs, uh, drugs which come uh, directly from uh, the Latin American continent to uh, Western Africa, in particular Guinea-Bissau, and there go through Mali to uh, Western Europe. And that is certainly a very potent factor in the situation that uh, we will be, uh, I believe, uh, facing. <laughs> One could equally make the point about South Sudan, which uh, for so many years was an area of an état de non-droit. I don't know how you say that in English. Uh, Non-rule of law, let's put it that way. And which therefore has attracted over the last uh, 10 to 15 years a number of uh, major criminal elements from all that part of Africa. And this is probably one of the reasons why there is such a high rate of crime in South Sudan, knowing, of course, that the uh, newly established state of South Sudan is having difficulties of its own, establishing itself, establishing its police. You know, 60% of the police of South Sudan are illiterate. So these are also facts that you have to take into account. Uh, and this is one of the challenges. This is one of the issues to which uh, we try to find solutions. So uh, I think all these are trends that uh, we will continue to, uh, to face. Uh, we have to be more than ever adaptive, to be creative. Uh, you were kind enough to mention the issue of new technologies. And yes, it is true that I hope that uh, by summer, for a time, the first time in the history of peacekeeping, uh, MONUSCO in eastern Congo will have the use of um, unmanned aerial systems uh, for surveillance purposes. I do say surveillance, not armed at all, but that I think uh, will give a boost very substantially into the awareness of uh, the situation by the force commander and his colleagues will help us do a better job in terms of protecting the civilians and of monitoring the movements of uh, various unsavory people and hopefully also exert some deterrence uh, on them. So as the British would say, proof of the pudding will be in the eating, but I certainly would hope that these machines will uh, have an effect. And as would the introduction of a number of uh, more up-to-date technologies which have nothing to do, let me be very frank, have nothing to do with intelligence or with highly sophisticated things, but simple things like motion sensors when you have to uh, monitor what is happening on a road, like uh, ground radar when you have to look for arms caches, like in the forest of Côte d'Ivoire. That sort of thing, I think, uh, is something that will make uh, a big difference. After all, who would have imagined 15 years ago that uh, armed attack helicopters would be an everyday occurrence in so many missions? And now I think uh, nobody finds exception to it. On the contrary, I think it is uh, a necessary tool. It serves a purpose and it helps in doing a better job. So what will happen, you know, uh, will happen. Uh, certainly there are many uh, unknowns, especially over the next uh, 15 years. I think the scenarios that you have uh, outlined do have a number of interesting uh, parameters. Certainly uh, the climate factor, the population factor, we know play a role already in some of the crises that we are dealing with. I think it's been said that the Darfur situation 
had much to do with a change in climate. <coughs> I think it's true that uh, uh, the population issues in uh, very densely populated areas uh, of Africa are also uh, a, fact of, a factor of uh, added uh, risk and uh, certainly an entrant to the problematics that we face. So I think uh, we will take things uh, as they come, trying to be uh, reactive, and I wish uh, to express my admiration to my colleagues in the almost now a year and a half I've been in uh, that particular uh, line of business. I think they are creative, they are uh, they do things with a will, they, you know, uh, I think it was Napoleon who said, uh, I don't want uh, people to come to me with problems, I want people to come to me with a solution. And this is what they're trying to do. And let me assure you that uh, between now and 2025, this is going to be uh, systematically what we will try to do. So thank you very much for uh, you know, highlighting all those uh, prospects. Et, ben, on verra. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left uh, for questions, answers, uh, before we move to, to a reception. So I'd like to, to throw the floor open if you have any questions to any of our panelists about uh, the presentations, <coughs> about the, the publication, about the future of peacekeeping key factors, any of the things that were raised, um, feel free to raise your hand. Please, right up front. Could you wait one second for the microphone and introduce yourself and your affiliation too, please? Thank you. Yeah. Unfortunately, I speak French, but um, I will try, because uh, <laughs> I would like to, to discuss make a comment, a brief comment about uh, <coughs> one of, uh, oh, I'm sorry. My name is uh, Nionzi Mayomenegild. Uh, I am uh, the PR of Burundi. Uh, I am, uh, thank you for giving the floor. I just wanted to make a comment about, uh, about one of the key factors which is uh, the scarcity of resources. But in the perspective of uh, armed conflict prevention, I don't, I'm not sure to which extent it is relevant, but I think it is worth listening to it. You know, whenever we talk about uh, civil war, uh, ethnic violence, conflicts, we refer to, to Africa continent almost always. Of course, there has been an uh, Arab Spring that came to make an exception to the rule, but uh, even the Arab Spring started in Africa continent. You know, I, I believe that uh, Africa, African, they are not naturally warriors. Hmm? The problem is poverty. Because with the scarcity of resources, there is a competition towards the management of poor resources we have. And uh, I can recall in a conference I participated in in Kinshasa in 2007 about DDR because they are. I worked with the DDR in my country before resuming my diplomatic career. I asked my colleagues of uh, regional countries how much a soldier is paid. I realized that uh, in general, in the general, an African soldier is paid less than $100. And we were discussing about disarmament and the reintegration, and the reintegration of combatants to normal civil life. But at the same time, 
uh, allowing combatants to join security forces in the countries. And can you imagine to, to, hand, to give a life threatening weapon to somebody you are paying less than $100? This is terrible. If you are a leader, this is terrible. So I think that uh, my conclusion was that we need to, to develop develop the continent because this is the key this is the, this is the solution and uh, and uh, that time uh, I didn't convince because <laughs> we were we were the topic was saying buying time they said what we are doing helping this country, the African economy, it's just buying time. So th there was no solution. So I think that we should think, hmm? uh, not the way we really, we really handle the issues in 2025, but the way we can stop hmm, the, 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 <coughs> the, the this armed conflict on our continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. So we have a uh, we have an answer. So uh, do we have uh, any questions um, as well? Yeah, please uh, write it from. Um, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the panelists whether they see uh, by 2025 any change in the way in who the peacekeepers are and how peacekeeping is financed because um, there is a um, financial pressures as was mentioned by Ambassador Berger on, on the people who are paying the greatest burden for peacekeeping and on the other hand, uh, virtually all of the peacekeepers come from developing countries. Thank you. Maybe we'll take one more and return to the panel. I think I saw it in the back there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hossein Ishar from the Mission of Egypt, and I would like to thank the panelists for their uh, briefings. My question is regarding robust peacekeeping. Um, two years ago, we, we saw the UN helicopters uh, participating in offensive operations in Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, in the coming months, we most probably will be seeing the intervention brigade participating in offensive operation with the participation of the Congolese army or without their participation. So uh, do you think that this kind of robust peacekeeping would be, the would be the future of peacekeeping operations and how it would impact on other issues related to peacekeeping, uh, like force generation, the financing, as was mentioned by one of the, of the, com uh, of the speakers before me, and also about what, what do you need from the Security Council? I mean, the dynamics in the Council, how it would be helpful for uh, supporting or enhancing the efforts of uh, the United Nations Secretariat in this regard? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are almost out of time, so I will have to bring it back to the panelists for their final comments. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here and thank the, the panelists especially for, for joining us today um, and for Ziff for this uh, very, very interesting publication. So maybe for final comments, we'll go first uh, in reverse order, or same order as before, go to Ambassador Berger and then um, Ahmed, and then final thoughts with uh, Mr. Lazus. Hello, thank you very much, and I would like to take up your question on uh, yeah, what changes we, we might expect. Uh, you know, if it comes to peacekeeping that is getting more and more complex and multidimensional, as the Under Secretary General, Mr. Latsus, has explained, um, then I think we need to shift this current balance a little bit. And I mentioned that in my introductory remarks, um, uh, citing the, the German defense minister who said that a 90% uh, uh, peacekeeping uh, supported by developing countries and 90% paid 
by uh, <coughs> some financial contributors is not the way forward. So I think that uh, Western countries will have to, to uh, take on a stronger share when it comes to the participation in operations. It doesn't mean, you know, in the case of Germany, speaking about large numbers of boots on the ground. I think this is not the idea and this is not necessary. But when it comes to enablers, when it comes to specialists there, I think uh, I would see our, our role and that of, of other Western countries. So yes, a stronger participation. When it comes to the financial burden, um, you know that this is a decision that is taken by the General Assembly. It's a so-called scale of assessment for peacekeeping operations, which currently states that the P5 pay 52% of the peacekeeping burden. And um, a huge number of countries, I think 120, 130, pay together less than 10%. Um, we have a G77 ministerial decision which says no G77 country should pay the full amount from the regular budget of its share. So here we have really a problem, I think, for the future. If this peacekeeping is a challenge for everybody and it uh, needs the support of everybody, then we have to find a new and, and better balance between all the countries, all the member states of the United Nations. But as I said, we just took a decision for the three years, for the coming three years, so time enough to, to continue this discussion. Thank you. Norman? Sorry, who the pe pe I would like to refer to your question that who the peacekeepers uh, w will be or how they, I mean, what functions they will take up and how they are financed. First of all, I mean, going back to uh, Mr. Latsu's remark, I mean, from the monitors on the Hill, we now, in terms of personnel, we have, of course, very um, specialized function, functions, only to talk about surveillance. There are certain technolo uh, technological expertise needed. Uh, so you, you really have uh, this development that more and more uh, specialization is needed in the peace operations, and I think this will also be true uh, in the future. Um, and of course, we all have to do our share in in training and also also finding these people to contribute uh, to uh, peace operations. The question about financing is actually in one of our scenarios. That I mean, I have mentioned before these norms uh, entrepreneurs, these mega foundations. And in one of the scenarios, you will also find that there are uh, private companies paying parts of the peacekeeping budget or supporting certain peace operations for whatever interest they have in a region. Uh, we had a case of, of, uh, of a company from Asia financing helicopters, for example, for a peace operations mission because these enabling functions were there was nobody else to, to, uh, to, to give the money for that. That might be the case, but of course, it's also a prob problematic uh, issue. And of course, what we want to stimulate with the scenarios is that we think about it now, what it would really matter for, for the future uh, of, of uh, peace operations. So we have thought about it uh, quite a lot. And of course, especially the private security companies played a huge role in our discussions. And I think the whole group uh, expressed a lot of worries with that. And of course, I think that the, the main advice coming out of the group is that we have to work on the rules of engagement uh, for these um, privatized parts of the security. That's from my side. Great. Thank you. Mr. Radzius, please. Thank you. Well, I couldn't agree more with uh, Ambassador Berger when he says that uh, there's something wrong, something not sustainable in a situation where 95% of our uniform personnel comes from the global south. And there, I must say, I derive some optimism, you know, for the first time ever. I was invited last week uh, to Dublin to take part in the um, informal meeting of defense ministers of the European Union. And it was an opportunity for me to say to the 28 uh, defense ministers that some of them actually had come to me over the last six to eight months saying that with now Afghanistan almost around the corner, they were, those countries, looking at a renewed 
engagement with the UN in terms of peacekeeping. And I think this, I think, is something which uh, I hope will go some way into not correcting altogether the issue, but certainly bringing more balance. I think this is what is uh, needed uh, to make the partnership that is uh, peacekeeping an effective one. Turning to the issue of uh, robust peacekeeping, uh, or effective peacekeeping, as one should say if one speaks uh, politically correct, uh, I think it's a very real issue, because of course there is a limit to what uh, one can do uh, in terms of uh, adding uh, robustness, for lack of a better word, uh, to a mandate which has been exercised by a number of contributing countries, you know, who uh, are not, will not be very comfortable, you know, with an added layer of uh, strength uh, in the mandate. So it's a matter of uh, talking, of course, because all that has, be, has to be a transparent process and trying to achieve a degree of comfort uh, sufficient uh, for all. But, but, but... You mentioned what do we need of the Security Council. I think what we need from the Security Council, above all, is clarity, is a sense of priority. You know, when I look at the mandate of MONUSCO, as you know, no less than 41 tasks, and none of these tasks is illegitimate. I mean, of course, we have to defend the women. Of course, we have to defend the children soldiers. Of course, and so on and so on. But at the end of the day, it is 41 tasks with no clear sense of priority, and this, I think, is where really we must uh, continue working with the Security Council to achieve uh, that sense of, uh, well, priority, that's not a word. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, uh, audience, for being here. And please get a copy, if you haven't already, on the way out of Peace Operations 2025. It's very, very thought-provoking as uh, Ambassador said, more scientific than political. So in that respect, very, very interesting. Also, um, stick around and have a drink if you can. And uh, thanks again. Goodbye.